Okay, now I believe this is one of the best passages that will give us a good clue about Jesus' growth, okay? About how he was raised up. Isaiah 53, verse 2, the Bible says, For he, Jesus, the whole chapter is about the Messiah Jesus, right? For he shall what? Grow up. So that's your key passage. Perhaps maybe the best passage on the, how Jesus Christ grew up. What kind of environment? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So basically, Jesus Christ grows up like a tender uh, plant, root out of a dry ground, meaning that not much attention. Notice the wording here, no beauty nor comeliness. Uh, when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire of him. So it seems as if that Jesus Christ, that uh, he doesn't gain much attention, but rather silence. So hence, we get the clue right here. For Jesus' uh, childhood... When he grew up, one thing to understand is that Jesus, his childhood was mostly in silence, not attention. Oh, uh, uh, I am still half asleep. All right, sorry. I only had a few hours of sleep, so uh, I'm not writing really well. All right, Jesus' growth was in silence. Now, there are these people who try to find some clues about Jesus Christ on his childhood, and historians and scholars have always discussed about Jesus Christ. There's an infatuation or a fascination on his childhood and the hidden mysteries. Why? Because Jesus is the most important person in history. Jesus is the most important person in history, and when there's a science and not much information, there's a tendency within human nature to want to know stuff, to know more about that. So then you'll hear all these accounts, and I could give the benefit of the doubt some of them could be true, but most of them that you hear is actually from Gnostic teachings, which is why there's a high skepticism I have concerning about these accounts of Jesus' childhood. But there are these people who try to dig up and search for his life, try to rediscover his childhood. Me, I believe that if you want to rediscover his childhood, it should be based on scripture alone. Amen. And I'm going to show you at the end of this video why scriptures describing Jesus' childhood is way better and much more preferable than all these fascinating, dramatic, interesting accounts that you hear about Jesus' childhood. Now, there are, uh, there's this one account where Jesus grew up. So where did Jesus grow up? And there are all these questions. And then I'm going to give you the places and the accounts, and then I'm going to tell you how much is true or false. And then you'd be surprised, some of the interesting stuff, how much of it could be true. And then when you look at the scriptures, some of you might be offended if you're fascinated with Gnostic teachings. Some of you might be offended how much of it is false. All right, so let's look at the scriptures. So, first of all, with Jesus' growth, we know that it was in silence. He didn't have much attention. So, when you look at, Bethel, uh, when you look at his growth in Nazareth, that's why you see silent years. Hence, it's called the 18 silent years of Jesus. Why? Because the Bible plainly told you that he's not going to get much attention. So then, when, are the, when, are, uh, when these Gnostics tried to blow up attention to something that God put silence, then that's something that they should be skeptical and be overtly cautious about. Uh, why do they make a big deal about trying to draw an attention to his silence years? That's something that they shouldn't put too much attention upon. And they're violating scripture. They're violating God's tendency of how he wanted Jesus Christ to be raised. Now, some of the accounts are this as follows. Where was Jesus Christ born and raised? So one of them was this, is that Jesus Christ, and like I told you, uh, some of it you'd be surprised could be true, and then other parts you might be offended that it'd be false when we compare with Scripture, but who cares? Scripture triumphs. One of the accounts is Jesus Christ could have went to England. Now, why is it that Jesus Christ could have went to England uh, during his growth? 
What happened was is because there's a certain person that he was close to. Now, you know in your Bible that there's a person named Joseph of Arimathea. All right. Now, Joseph of... Now, I don't know how to spell Arimathea. Let me just do it from the top of my head, okay? And then I'll guess I'll look at it later when we look at the verses. But uh, Joseph of Arimathea here, he is supposed, supposedly where a lot of people don't know about kin to Jesus. Why is that? Because Jesus' father, or supposed father in the scripture, all right, foster father, earthly father is Joseph. So because the earthly foster father is Joseph, it might be possible that through that kinship, Joseph of Arimathea might be related to Joseph's line or some other line in Jesus' family. Joseph of Arimathea, why he is such a very wealthy man is because he's a tin maker. And then he did business dealings through the trade route of the Roman Empire. Now remember, Rome had trade routes that reached all the way to the Druids up to Britain, and then it can go as far as to China because of that famous Silk Route. So the Roman Empire expanded that far. Hence, they teach that Jesus Christ, he went on a business trip helping out uh, Joseph of Arimathea, which is supposedly his great uncle, and helping out his great uncle traveled all the way to England and then did business dealings in England. And while Jesus did business dealings in England, you know who were there that time. During that time, there were the Druids. So then Joseph of Arimathea supposedly had business dealings in England, and then during that time, the religion was the religion of the Celtic Druids. So then you know about the horror stories with the Druids. There were some elements of human sacrifice and something that's pretty satanic and nature worship. Jesus Christ supposedly went over there and then because of the miracles that he did and the wisdom that he had, then the Druids, they were drawn and influenced by it. So look at Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. This is probably the crux of where all these people are fascinated to what Jesus may have done. These deeds at England and other places. Why? Because when we look based off of Luke chapter 2, this is the clue on verse 52 on all those fascinating legends and accounts about Jesus Christ, what he did during his growth. Luke chapter 2, verse 52. The Bible says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So what did Jesus do during his growth? Well, notice right here he had the favor of the people, supposedly that might be interpreted as to these people, or, and growing in wisdom and knowledge. So because of that, he was able to influence the Celtics or the people in England. And then the Druids, where these Druids supposedly, a good number of them forsook their religion, converted to Christianity. But then the reason why I don't believe in that account is this, because where there's a mixture of Druids and Celtic Christianity is because during the time of, remember Patrick who uh, went to Britain and then had a mass conversion over there, is because those who followed along after Patrick, they were mingling with the uh, Celtic teachings, the Druid teachings with Christianity. So because they were mingling these accounts and Jesus is such an important person to them, Obviously, they want to mingle somehow Jesus with the Druids' teachings or with the Celtic culture or the British culture that time. So how do you not know that these accounts and these stories about Jesus having an influence in Britain with the Druids, it came because of the rise, and it was the number one religion that time, was the Celtic type of Christianity during that time. So then how do you not know they came up with these stories? So there's a lot of uh, infamous uh, historical accounts where, these, where the Christians, when they minister to the pagans, they mingle paganism with Christianity. So you've learned that in your intermediate discipleship class. That was the problem with all these Christians. And because of that, that's the reason why the Lord didn't really bless their ministries at the end. They faded out of the memories of man. So the Lord didn't really use them after that. 
So that's the reason why I don't believe that account. But also look at some of the verses here. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27. Now another teaching is this, is that when Jesus Christ died, then there's that famous Arthurian legend, which came from England, remember, about the Holy Grail. So then this Holy Grail idea, which ties to King Arthur legends, and it's the base of England's stories. Where did that come from? Well, they say that Joseph of Arimathea is the source. But how so? Because he's related to Jesus being the great uncle. And when Jesus died on the cross, Joseph of Arimathea supposedly had the Holy Grail. And then uh, he kept it uh, at England. But, obviously, that's not supported by Scripture, and I'm going to prove to you why. First of all, Joseph of Arimathea is, has no kinship relationship with Jesus Christ. You might say, why? Because look at Matthew chapter 27 and verse 57. Matthew chapter 27, and then we'll look at verse 57. When the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was what? Jesus' disciple. So it's important to understand that Joseph of Arimathea was Jesus' disciple. Now look at the book of Matthew 13. Matthew 13. So he believed in Jesus' teachings. He believed what Jesus preached and taught. And he was a supporter of Jesus' ministry. Well, look at Matthew chapter 13. Look who didn't support Jesus' ministry. Look at verse 54. And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren? Verse 56. And his sisters. Verse 57. And they were offended in him, but Jesus said unto him, them, A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. Now look at Mark 6. Mark 6. Now I'm going to read this quickly because I don't have time. So I'm just going to go over there and then read it quickly. But if you look at the book of Mark chapter 6, the Bible says at verse 4, what did Jesus say? But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. So notice right here, Jesus' own kin did not believe in his teaching and his ministry. Jesus even said that. Wait a minute, if Joseph of Arimathea was believed in Jesus' teaching, was his faithful disciple, then how come over here at Matthew 16 and Mark 6, Jesus' kin or his family members' relationships didn't believe in his teachings and ministry. See that? So Joseph of Arimathea is his kin. You can sooner believe in Santa Claus falling out of a Christmas tree, falling out of the sky more than Joseph of Arimathea being his great uncle. All right? Let's look at some other passages at Luke, uh, John chapter 1. John chapter 1. So we see right here that Jesus Christ is not related to Joseph. The Bible doesn't talk about some sort of magical holy grail that you go out and find. All of that is just fairy tale nonsense. Jesus, wh where did he grow up in? You got to realize he didn't go to England. The Bible actually shows when he grew up at Isaiah 53 verse 2, it was a place of silence. Wait, those, how did he get the attention of Druids then? How did he get the attentions of the entire culture at England and get them to convert? The Bible demands that Isaiah 53 verse 2, he didn't grab attention. He was in silence. See that? So I don't believe that he went to England. I believe that he stayed in Nazareth. That's where he was in. And that uh, he didn't draw attention to himself. The Bible shows that's where he was grown up in. Why? Isaiah 53 verse 2 demanded that. And not only that, John chapter 1 verse, John chapter 1 and verse 
45, verse 45. Notice the Bible points out that Jesus, even when he started his ministry, people recognized that he came from Nazareth and that he was grown up in Nazareth. Like he didn't travel around the world. That's what they like to teach. He traveled around the world. No, he was all the time in Nazareth. And then over there, that's why people had a spite because they know Nazareth doesn't draw attention to itself. It's a place that's not popular. That's why Isaiah 53, 2 said that uh, when he grows up, it's like a root out of a dry ground. He didn't have a place of attention. He didn't have a place uh, where, he gained, uh, where he had a, a living that people would think, oh, what a great, great place. This must be a great guy. No, he came out of a no man's land. So then they would think that he's a nobody. Look at John chapter 1, verse 45. Philip not findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law, and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So notice right here that they say that Jesus of Nazareth, he comes from Nazareth. And look how Nathanael responds at verse 46. And Nathanael said unto him, There are so many good things that can, No, can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Why? Because Nazareth is a place of silence, no place of attention. But if they said, oh yeah, uh, what if Philip said, Jesus came from England, the land of Druids, and you know what Nathaniel would do? Whoa, let me see what this guy has to say. Why? Because it's a new land, new terrain, and makes you interested. But when you say Nazareth, then they're like, no, that's like just a little city in no man's land in, the, in my country. So there's no doubt that Jesus Christ, uh, where he was raised, was in Nazareth. He didn't go, like, all the way up to England. When we look at uh, other passages here, let's look at Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1 and verse 80. Luke chapter 1, and then we'll read verse 80. Now, the next question, if we want to find clues about Jesus, how he was raised, we got an idea. He grew up in silence, and it was in Nazareth, so we got that. He was born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth. Another thing that draws to mind is how we can find the next clue and rediscover in the Bible. So far, notice we're looking at the scriptures, right? So here you got an idea how Jesus Christ grew up in. So another clue how we know how Jesus Christ grew up is, wait a minute, what about his relationship with John the Baptist? Because of Mary and Elizabeth being some uh, cousins or distant cousins, then Jesus Christ with his cousin or distant cousin with John the Baptist, I wonder how they were raised. Did they know each other? Did they play together? I wonder what it was like. Actually, the Bible does show how Jesus Christ uh, got along with John the Baptist and what he did during the childhood with John the Baptist. You might go, ooh, ooh, what is it? All right, so let's look at the scriptures. First of all, let's see John the Baptist, how he was born and raised. Then we'll kind of know how Jesus Christ was born and raised. His relationship with Jesus. Let's look at Luke chapter 1, verse 80. Notice that John the Baptist, he was raised in the wilderness, okay? So then uh, he, he was born with his family, but then he started to be raised at the wild, at the wilderness. Luke chapter 1, verse 80. And the child grew, so that's John the Baptist, and waxed strong in spirit, and was in the where? Deserts, till the day of his showing unto Israel. So he was raised out in the deserts then. So he was uh, growing up and being raised out in the deserts until God called him to publicly reveal himself and to minister to the Jews. Now, think about this. There's one, there are people, if you look at your Bible, this happens several times with people in the Bible, that before they had a public ministry, that they went to the desert. Why did they go to the desert? So that God can have one-on-one time with them. And it is evident throughout the Bible we've seen this kind of pattern that God had one-on-one -on -one dealings with certain ministers in the desert 
And that's where they were trained and raised. So basically, uh, if you have a Bible institute in a non-beautiful campus where it's so just run down and it's just so isolated and desolate and it's not beautiful like Harvard or Berkeley or huge like Liberty University and uh, beautiful buildings like Disneyland PCC and if you attended and studied Bible over there uh, over in a non-beautiful place that's totally opposite from those places then you must be in the right you might say how so the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 1 and Galatians chapter 2 was also taught in the deserts as well. He was taught out in the deserts, no man's land, one-on-one time with God, and then came out publicly into the ministry. He was the same thing like John the Baptist. But guess what? Before Jesus started his public ministry, where was he as well? In the wilderness, in the deserts too. So Jesus Christ, he was in the wilderness over here. So he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by the devil. Why would the devil tempt him? Because before he starts his public ministry, that's the devil's chance right there. But Jesus Christ, he was out in the desert. And that's where the Lord was uh, honing him and be preparing him for the ministry, like he did with Paul, like he did with John the Baptist. So then that's our next clue then. So then we're going to find out. So then what did God do with uh, John the Baptist? And then did Jesus Christ encounter possibly John the Baptist out in the wilderness? So then you get these uh, movies that give this kind of false depiction. Uh, how much is true or false, we may not know. But we do know that there are some uh, false depictions in some of these movies like... Um, Martin Scorsese, he tried to put this movie about the last temptation and that Jesus Christ and John the Baptist, like they were able to buddy-buddy with each other find, and then uh, help each other in the ministry. Why? Because John the Baptist told Jesus supposedly the wilderness or desert he came from and so Jesus went over there too. And supposedly that's where you get out in, at, into the desert gurus over there. That's where the Gnostics get their heresies from, right? So then you get that aestheticism, that Eastern teaching, and that weird kind of baloney stuff. So that's how they depict it. Now, the historians have wondered, could Jesus Christ and John the Baptist then, they met each other in the wilderness, and could they have come across the Essenes who were in charge of the Dead Sea Scrolls? So there's that fascination with the historians. They wonder if John the Baptist and Jesus Christ encountered these people. And then you hear this teaching where John the Baptist and Jesus Christ, that they join this weird fringe cult, the Essenes, and then that's the reason why Jesus Christ's teaching was cultic and fanatical to standard Judaism that time, to the Pharisees. Why? Because the Essenes, they were a cultic, fanatical group of people. So John the Baptist and Jesus Christ could have been influenced by them and then had their dealings with them during the time that they were grown up and raised. So could Jesus Christ have went out in the wilderness and then went out with a bunch of fanatics over there and got influenced by their teachings before he started his ministry? So that's the kind of thing that you'll hear from them. But uh, obviously the answer is no. Go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. That is baloney. That is baloney. You might say, why is that baloney? Because, one, believe it or not, standard historians don't believe in that either. They find it too much far-fetched. Why? Because the Essenes, they were zealots, actually. Now, some people will try to point out that James the Zealot joined Jesus' ministry. So because of that, you've seen some of these elements of the Essenes. But no, that's not true because Jesus Christ, why he had James the Zealot join his ministry is just like in Bible-believing churches, you get these zealots who don't follow the standard religion and governments, but you train them and you correct them into loving, into making peace, and not causing divisions or problems. And there's no doubt in Jesus' ministry, he didn't come down to cause chaos and division. See, he was all about, he wasn't about rebellion against the government. He followed, uh, he even followed concerning their taxation thing. 
Even when he was questioned by the Pharisees, Jesus said, render unto Caesars the things that are Caesars, and to God the things that are God's. So notice that Jesus Christ, no, he didn't follow the Essenes. Some of the people would like to point out, but Jesus Christ said that I came not to give peace but a sword. That's what they'll point out. And Jesus Christ, he came down as conquering king, which is interesting. The Essenes, they were looking for that Messiah, a king to set up and to conquer the Roman government. So that's why they see Jesus Christ. He may have had dealings with the Essenes, but that's baloney. Why? Because we believe in a doctrine called dispensationalism. In other words, we believe in rightly dividing verses to the right group of people to the right time period. Why? Because if you don't, you will combine all the verses together as one and come up with wrong doctrine and crazy kooky stuff that Jesus Christ had dealing with the Essenes. That's what you end up with without dispensationalism. How does dispensationalism answer it? I'll tell you how it answers it. The reason why is because when Jesus Christ said, I came not to give peace but a sword, and he knows he comes down as concrete king, is because that's his second coming. And his second coming is after he dies on the cross. He comes in as humble, lowly, peaceful Jesus Christ. And then when he stamps out the government, sets up as king of kings, lord of lords, those teachings that he taught, that's applied to his second coming. It's that simple. Now, look at John chapter 1, verse 46. This is very interesting. This will show you what Jesus Christ did with John the Baptist in his childhood. Like, could they have played together? Could they have fun together? Could they, uh, when they were growing up as kids? Well, look at John chapter 1, verse 46. Uh, uh, John chapter 1, verse 29, excuse me. John chapter 1, verse 29. We already read 46, 29. The Bible says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now notice that John, he, when he sees Jesus, there's not like a, you know, a hug, or there's like a greeting that I haven't seen you for a long time, or, hey, cousin. Because keep reading here. He treats him like God. Verse 30, this is he of whom I said, after me cometh the man, which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I what? Knew him not. There's your next clue. Jesus Christ and John the Baptist, even though they were related, they didn't meet each other all that time. So he didn't have a childhood with John the Baptist then. He didn't have a childhood with John the Baptist. Keep reading verse 31, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. Verse 33, and I knew him not. He repeated that again. But he that sent me to baptize with water. Then that shows right here that when Jesus Christ was born, that Mary and Elizabeth and John the Baptist, they weren't close with each other. And John, that John the Baptist knew that Jesus is God. He didn't know who the Messiah was or who God is. It was kept secret all that time. Maybe Elizabeth knew about that because she talked about the mother of my Lord, so to speak. She worded it that way when she met Mary. But then after that, it went AWOL. After that, there was not much attention after that. So we see right here that uh, Jesus Christ and John the Baptist, that they didn't know each other. So that's the second thing you can know about his uh, childhood. Another example is uh, John chapter 2, John chapter 2, verse 1. John chapter 2 and verse 1. Another clue to what Jesus Christ did during his growth, during those missing 18 years, and we're rediscovering it. This is the one you're all fascinated with. And then you're all going to Gnostic heresies to find the truth about how Jesus was raised. Why don't you look at the Word of God? You could have found these answers, but you, you didn't see these answers. Why? You, didn't, you spent too much time on YouTube. You spent too much time on fascinating stories from people talking about Santa Claus to Jesus with the Essenes and John the Baptist coming out from a fringe little cult group out in the wilderness that Darth Vader is Luke Skywalker's father. You spend too much time watching those stuff, <laughs> listening to those stories. That's what grabbed your attention. But when you read the Bible, it's telling you are guilty of falling asleep and think that you don't get anything cool out of it. 
whatever cool is. Notice all this stuff I'm showing you from the Word of God. It's too bad I have to translate into a catchy YouTube title and then doing it in drawing and stuff like that so that you can finally open your eyes and see how fascinating the Bible is. Under conviction yet? All right. John chapter 2 and verse 1. It's like some of you suckers, and I'm guilty of that too, some of you suckers when, uh, you know, one of our brothers here start teaching and you go, oh, it's a basic doctrine, I already know that. But then he has to put a title like The Great Rest to get your attention, and then you <laughs> click on it, and then you're the sucker that says, oh, wow, this is a great teaching finally. See that? Why? It's too bad he has to translate into that to grab your attention. All right. All right. John chapter 2 and verse 1. Verse 1. Why not be fascinated all the time, no matter what teaching or preaching it is? Huh? I get a blessing from onlineers who watch the, our young men here preaching, and then they, they get excited. They get stirred up from that. I mean, it's just a typical sermon, something that you would think, oh, it's something I already know. Oh, it's a guy that I don't really know about. No, man, you get moved by that. Why? Because you came to hear the Holy Spirit of God and not man. All right. Next clue, what Jesus Christ did is that we know that Joseph of Arimathea was not Jesus' kin. However, we know that Jesus Christ, he did have kin, Okay. So then, growing up in Nazareth, people obviously knew about him. So they knew about him, and Jesus Christ obviously had spent time with family members, friends, and people in the city of Nazareth. Having encounters with people, then we know that he had relationships. So he definitely had some connection or relationships with others in his terrain. So Jesus Christ had relationships. He had either friends or family members that he was related to. So that would be normal. When Jesus Christ was born and if uh, Mary, uh, Mary, his mother, mentioned that, hey, we got to go to uh, your grandpa's funeral or your uncle's funeral or we have to attend this uh, homecoming meeting, or it, Jesus Christ, he may have had some friends in the neighborhood, and then the friends may have invited him over to their place. So that is possible. That is highly possible that Jesus Christ did that. You might say, why? Because, notice right here, he received a wedding invitation. And why? Because he had connections with either a family member or a friend this was at a wedding invitation. And he was so close with this person that Mary was the one in charge of trying to host the event in the wedding. So that's another clue we know about Jesus' childhood then, is that undoubtedly he had relationships with people in his area. Let's look at John chapter 2, verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was what? Called. All right, so he was invited. And his disciples to the marriage. Notice they added his disciples. Why is that? Because then that means he must have been really close with this person at the wedding. Why? It's like, for example, the reason why I was invited over to an event or a wedding, if I'm very close with that person, they would allow me to bring some of my members with me. My disciples with me. See that? So that's what happened right here. It's the same case. And you've seen that with uh, my dad's church people. Sometimes when they invite me over, then they'll have some of my other members over or my disciples, right? You've seen that before. Uh, when I visit other pastors or the churches, uh, they, they allowed me to invite some of my disciples and members over. Some of you might remember that uh, last year, you know? So we had a lot of fun on that one. Uh, some of you thought that you had ADHD when you met them or you went high-pitched voice and got scared with some of these people. So I, I regretted that, so I'm going to try to uh, take you with me at a more comfortable setting, okay? <laughs> I'll try to do that next time, yeah. One of them was so suspicious of Daniel all the time, he said, you know, you're quiet, you know. Try to get something out of him, you know. Try to get something out of him. 
Jonathan was the only normal guy. Can you believe that? Jonathan was the only person that was normal there. Everybody else, we were just all like, this is kind of weird. You know? <laughs> all right, but anyway, that's, I just, uh, that's something funny for my church. Onliners don't have a clue what I'm talking about, but uh, because this is a church setting, I want to bring that to my church to make it more fun for them. Okay, but anyway, the point is, is that Jesus had family or friend relationships. If you look at right here, that Jesus, uh, Jesus' mother was in charge of verse 3, and when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Verse 5, his mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. See that? She was hosting this event. She was in charge. So there's no doubt Jesus Christ, he had close friends or close family relationship. So he had social contacts. Jesus Christ had social contacts. However, even though Jesus Christ, he did have social contacts, there's another thing that we can know about Jesus is at Luke chapter 2, and go to 48 again, Luke chapter 2 and verse 48. Luke chapter 2, and then we'll go to verse 48. There's something you want to know about Jesus Christ when he was raised as a child, okay? Okay. So basically, he was not considered to be the normal child, okay? So he's not like a typical child who would go out and concentrate on having fun in games and then laughing and then, you know, being like, he is not Robert Randall, let's just say, all right? <laughs> Jesus is not Robert Randall, getting along, you know, cool guy for his age, you know, stuff like that. You know, you would think that he's... He, he can get away with 18-year-olds uh, and young 20s, you know. He, he's the guy you'd want to invite in your college party, okay? <laughs> yeah. So he was not like Randall, oh, cool stuff, you know, like that. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So what you kind of get out of Jesus Christ's childhood was this, is that even though he had social contacts, social relationships, he was not really type of person that was like overtly sociable or a person that's like really getting along with people or cool, like your Calvary Chapel pastors would try to act, right? right. Calvary Chapel pastors and these uh, Calvinists and these uh, emergent church movements, non-denominational churches, they think that being a Christian is, you know, to have a good Christian testimony is, yeah, you have to go down with the world and be cool along with them and be so sociable. Hey, aren't you supposed to follow Jesus? Jesus Christ didn't go down to your level. If Jesus Christ was here on the earth, no, I don't think that he'd be the type of person that would come down to your level and that he would have, uh, he would have these skinny jeans and then earrings and playing electric guitar during church service. I can't pick... Jesus Christ wouldn't, wasn't... That wasn't his teenage years or his childhood. Why would Christian churches then try to depict Jesus and your God that way, that kind of environment, that kind of religion? You know what Jesus Christ was? They accuse us of being too stiff, too formal, too spiritual, non-worldly, because that was Jesus' attitude. Now, here's the thing. There's nothing wrong with having fun, games, and laughter, or being, what do you want to call it, cool to your level. There's nothing wrong with doing these things as long as it's not uh, anti-spiritual and anti-scriptural. There's nothing wrong with these things, okay? So I'm not putting down on those things. But when you call us stiff, too formal, too spiritual, and stuff like that, you got to realize that was Jesus' life. Okay, so let me give some clues here. One is pretty simple. When you read Jesus' conversations or Jesus Christ when he interacted with people in the Bible, you see that he was usually a serious type of person. Now, maybe he did some jokes here and there because we see that in the Bible, God does have a sense of humor. So that can be in his nature, all right? So Jesus Christ, he does have that, but mostly it's serious, it's formal, and he's, usual, and he's always spiritual. That's the thing about Jesus Christ. That's good. But another thing about Jesus Christ, he wasn't too high to think that, no, I'm too spiritual for you, and he didn't get along with people. No, he got along with the prostitutes and the tax collectors. So he knew that no, uh, you know, I'm too spiritual and stuff like that. No, he went down to their level and did get along with them. All right? So, 
Here, uh, here we see some examples about Jesus' character personality. So then you can picture his growth as a child then, his teenage years. He was that type of person. In Luke chapter 2 and verse... Thank you so much. 48. Got it now. 48. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that he sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. So notice Jesus Christ that he was considered not normal. He was always at a focus and a mindset about God the Father. So, he, so when he grew up, his personality was he was always thinking about his relationship with God the Father and then how he dealt with him. Now, when you have a mindset of, you know, talking to God the Father and then going along with God the Father's plans and systems, it's going to be kind of weird, actually, when you hang around with Jesus Christ then. So then uh, we've seen these cases in the Bible, right, where the disciples are eating a normal meal, and Jesus Christ, he said, you know, beware of the bread of the Pharisees. <laughs> weird. <laughs> and Jesus Christ just keeps eating his bread, and the disciples are like, weird, you know, like that. <laughs> Another example. Another example, uh, another example uh, that you see about Jesus Christ where he's not considered to be normal but uh, strange and then it doesn't follow along with uh, the disciples' type of thinking is that the disciples bring him food. You remember that time he said he don't want leaven of the Pharisees? You made sure not to go to the Sanhedrin area markets and buy bread, right? No, we didn't, we didn't. All right, we made sure not to buy any leaven close to the Pharisees. So we bought this bread. Jesus is hungry now. And they go to Jesus and they said, here you go, master. And Jesus said, no, I'm already full. I have meat that you don't know of. <laughs> Imagine the teenagers are all playing around and say, hey, Jesus, you want candy? And Jesus said, no, I had candy that you know not of. <laughs> okay, Jesus, you know. So that's what, so uh, why do I believe that? Because there seems to be an atmosphere where people who were close and knew Jesus Christ, that they knew him as a type of person to be basically a, a more quiet type of person that he, they, they weren't really close to, that drew attention. And not only that, that they see him as too spiritual and kind of weird. So here are some examples of that. So Luke chapter 2, we see an example of that, but we're going to come back here. We're going to come back here. Go to another passage, which is Matthew 13. Uh, John 7, excuse me, John 7. John 7. And then Matthew 13. So John 7 and Matthew 13. So that's how Jesus Christ was raised then from what we see here in the Bible. So it's very possible that he could have been raised that way. So I'm just going to say possibility because I can't really predict, but from what I'm seeing in the scriptures, I'm seeing a pattern of his character right here. You can tell uh, certain signs of his personality and character, how he acted. So let's look at John chapter 7, and then we'll read verse 3. Notice that Jesus Christ, that like he talked to Mary... And then Joseph that, uh, hey, we looked for you for days. Where were you? And Jesus Christ, the answer that he gave was, I was uh, doing the job of my father. Imagine you were a parent. You lost your child in the middle of a mall, and you got mad at that child. Why didn't you follow us? And the child said that, God, the father told me to be here. <laughs> then you would go, <laughs> what in the world, you know? What in the world, right? So... But Mary and Joseph, they didn't treat Jesus that way because they already knew from God the Father that this was going to be a strange child, that he had a connection with God the Father. But guess what? You know, his brothers, his sisters, and then, you know, the friends and the people around him, when they saw that, they would think that he's weird. They would think he's weird. So look at John chapter 7. And then we'll look at verse 3. His brethren, therefore, Jesus' own family, people who are close to him, therefore said unto him, Depart hence and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. See that? Because Jesus Christ is a type who's so spiritual in God's business that the people that had social relationships around him, 
you know, they saw that as weird. And they mocked him, like, why don't you do the miracle, you know, if you're God and if you're doing the Father's work. Verse 4, for there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. And then uh, verse 5, for neither did his brethren believe in him. But verse 6, Jesus said unto them, my time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Imagine that. Imagine when Jesus Christ, he's doing these things, and these teenagers say, okay, you know, I kind of heard, you know, from the grapevine over there that, you know, somehow you, you're some kind of spiritual leader and that you're close to God. Why don't you do a magic trick for us? You know, turn these stones into bread, you know. And Jesus Christ, all he replied is, no, it's not my time yet. Ah, you're pulling up an excuse. You can't do it. So that's how they treated Jesus Christ. Now imagine how much Jesus Christ had a lot of love and patience and understanding on that. I mean, he could have just been tempted to show his power, but a lot of teenagers in his years would have fell, fallen to peer pressure. Excuse me, grown adults are doing that now too, sadly. That's some discipline Jesus Christ had. Always thinking about, it. he didn't care if he looked weird for being spiritual, but you guys are. And that's why you have to fit in the standard of the world and try to be cool and normal like them. No, Jesus didn't care about that. All right. So we see right here about Jesus' personality and example. Uh, notice right here, you're getting a lot more from this teaching than these uh, weird legends and stories, what they like to describe about Jesus Christ. Why? Because you're getting stories about Jesus' childhood that's a blessing to you because... you. He was going through the normal Christian struggles that you're going through right now. You get more of a blessing from what the Bible says about Jesus' childhood and learn from that than him going to a wilderness with a bunch of scenes or going to England having a holy grail. How can you learn stuff from that? All right, here's another example is, uh, my goodness, time flies. I have to wrap this up quickly. I've got a lot more, so let me try to wrap this up quickly because you'd hate me if I don't finish this, right? So... Let's do this. Now, when we see some of these passages over here, another thing about Jesus Christ is this. When you look at John 2, what did Mary do all of a sudden? She asked Jesus, they have no wine. Why would she do that to Jesus? She knew he had the power, that he did miracles. Why would she do that all of a sudden? The reason why is this, is that it might have been a possibility during his childhood, there may have been some miracles. You might say, why is that possible? Because of Luke chapter 2, it mentioned about he grew in uh, wisdom and etc. So notice that some of his deity aspects were coming out during his growth. So during his growth, I mean, one example is when he stumped all the Pharisees and Sadducees at the age of 12. Now, that's a deity power he revealed. That's not a normal human power. So it may have been possible during his childhood he did some deity glimpses of power. Now, I don't know how much of it is true or not, but then you hear these accounts and some of these Gnostics uh, just believe in it where they find these fascinating accounts where Jesus Christ... He saw a dead bird and then he resurrected the bird and then it flew again. And then Jesus Christ, uh, some of the kids were making fun of him because he was kind of weird. And then he put a curse on them. So I don't, so the, that kind of stuff that you hear, uh, a lot of it, I'm just skeptical, if not all of it, pretty much. But we see right here that there may have been possibilities during his childhood. Some of the miracles or deity stuff it could have been possible during that time. Otherwise, why would Mary ask Jesus to do a miracle? Now, notice right here that that's why it makes so much sense. Here's another thing about Jesus' childhood. He hid his power. He tried to hide it. So there were some moments he revealed it, but then he mostly hid it. Now, here's a good passage right here. I under what did Jesus mean I must be about my father's business? I now know what that means. Or if I don't know the full meaning, I know a little bit. In John chapter 2, 
Mary wanted him to uh, do some sort of miracle, right? But what did Jesus respond at verse 4? It sounded very rude, unless he was hiding his power. And he didn't want his mom to reveal his power. So that's why Jesus rudely said at verse 4, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour has not yet come. Why? Because Jesus hid his power. But mom wanted Jesus to show off his power. Luke 2, mom didn't expect Jesus to show off his power. But Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. Why? Because that was his time to reveal his power. But then at John 2, Jesus Christ said, you know, that wasn't my time yet. John chapter 7, Jesus said, my time is not yet come to his brethren. See that? So there were moments that it was not God's timing yet, and other times that uh, it was God's timing. Hey, why don't you show off the power? Why would God do that at the age of 12 to those Pharisees and Sadducees? I think it shows how much God has a spite and disrespect for the scholar system and want to dumbfound them. And maybe, just maybe, some people accuse me of arrogance and being too mean. Maybe that's why the Lord allows me and blesses my ministry when I kick these scholars. Even though it's, the presentation might be too mean and not too wise and not too smart and maybe a little bit too arrogant. Maybe that's why God might bless our ministry. You got to realize that's God's personality and character. He has a total disrespect of scholarship. That's the reason why I put mud all over these stupid Christian teachers and pastors who have such a high respect for education and scholarship that they want to mingle that, mingle that with their Christian talk and use that to put down people if they don't follow along with their ideology. I hate that, man. I don't show any respect for that. You know what my crowd is? Give me the weirdos. Give me the rundown people. Give me the people who had lived their lives in sin out from the streets. Those are the people. All right, give me those people. All right? And if some of these idiotic Calvinist trolls say, look at these fruits right here. He's got a bunch of weird people, and they try to point out that, that out to me. I don't want your people who are flowing eloquent in such speech and tothery language that when you talk, you shoot flowers out of your mouth. I don't like that. I don't want your fruits. Well, I graduated from Liberty, Bob Jones, and then se seminary here and cemetery there and a dead cemetery right there. I don't like those, all right? I don't like those. I have total disrespect for that. You don't gain my respect. I mean, me, if I'm going to play your education field level, I'll laugh down. I'll play your mind game. I'll act like you, and let's see how you feel. What? You graduated from this kind of seminary? I graduated from Berkeley. What are you talking about? <laughs> Look at you, man. Wow, you must have had a, a lot of free rides over there. They're, they're very academically low that... Uh, your GPA wasn't that high. You had to end up in that kind of Christian school. That's how you guys do it. And you make me stinking angry on that one. And you call my presentation mad and arrogant and stuff like that. You're too blind. I think you have more respect for scholarship than I do. Eloquence than I do. All right, I'm done. I'm not going to park it there. All right. <laughs> Because I only have one more minute left, and I'm not making progress right here with this teacher. <laughs> All right, then. All right, then. So, so I'm going to make singing practice much, uh, much shorter time, I guess, or something like that. <laughs> All right, here we go. So Jesus' power was hidden during his childhood in hometown, but glimpse of it, glimpses of it might have been revealed. Now... The thing is, then you get these accounts from Notovich. That's the most famous story. And you're going to see that all over. That gets lots of views. But Notovich, supposedly, he went to uh, India or he went to some sort of uh, Asian territory or Eastern country. And then he got it from one of these monks. I think it was a Tibetan monk that claimed that there was a person named Isa who did come to their territory and did miracles and did teachings. So then Notovich started to explore and research more, and he was very convinced that this was referring to Jesus. Now, I believe that he's right that those Timitian monks were talking about Jesus Christ. But here's the thing, is that those Tibetan monks, they said that Jesus Christ, uh, he went to 
uh, India and to Tibet and then to Persia, where that's where you get a lot of his teachings about peace and you know not doing bloody wars and loving the poor and the people who are struggling in poverty is because of Buddhism, Jainism, Hinduism, Zoroastrianism that he encountered. And it's the same thing like those uh, Druid stories that when he went to these areas, the people thronged about him, they loved him, and then they were drawn to his teachings. And it's those caste leaders that really hated Jesus Christ, actually. So then Jesus Christ, he had to leave that territory and then go to a different territory. In fact, he drew so much, so much controversy from uh, India, where he influenced the people in Jainism and then Hinduism, then to Tibet, where he influenced the uh, monks and the people there into Buddhism, that when he reached Persia with Zoroastrianism, the empire was scared of him. They didn't want him to enter their territory, and then hence he went back to Palestine. The reason why it was possible for Jesus to travel in all those routes is because of the Roman Empire with their trade routes. And, and just like Luke chapter 2, Jesus Christ did go with that caravan trade route when he went, uh, when his parents were searching for him. See, so when he was 12. So that's why they argue it would have been possible for him at 14 to do the same thing. Now, you can argue the possibility of that, and that would make sense, but I disagree that uh, he went to India, Persia, Tibet, and all that. You might say, why do you believe? why you don't believe in that. The reason why is this, is that one, I believe they are talking about Jesus, but it's the same thing like the Druid account. The Nestorians and other people infamously, when they brought Christianity to their territory, they mingled Jesus with those accounts. See that? The earliest accounts and evidences is the four Gospels. You can't get better evidence than that. All those stories and accounts are later. See that? That's why I don't agree with those teachings. And secondly, Jesus' teachings totally contradict Eastern teachings. I have another video that was a pretty big amount of views if you want to watch it. It's uh, the missing 18 years of Jesus revealed. And over there I debunk completely that Jesus Christ was learning yoga when he was spending time with the Father in prayer, learning Hinduism, Buddhism, all that garbage and baloney. Jesus Christ didn't get into that kind of stuff. Another thing is because Jesus Christ, I've shown you passages, he was staying and he grew up where all of his life? Nazareth, all right? He didn't go to the other areas. Uh, let's look at uh, John 19 and Matthew 13. All right, now go to John 19. And then keep your hand at Matthew 13. John 19 and Matthew 13. All right, this is going to be a long teaching, but anyways. All right. I feel bad for the people at the nursery. All right, let's. All right, but I have to keep going right here. So let me try to be wise on the time here. Now, notice in Matthew chapter uh, 13, the Bible reads here at Matthew chapter 13 and verse, let's see right here. Matthew chapter 13 and verse... Verse 55, verse 55. And then John chapter 19 and verse 26. Jesus' father, Joseph, died during his childhood. So that's another thing that I noticed. Joseph died during Jesus' childhood. That's one thing that I know. So Jesus Christ did go to a funeral. I'm sure that he had to go through mourning for his uh, earthly father's death or foster father's death. So whenever I say father, I don't mean how the Holy Spirit words it, obviously. So forgive me if I do that. But let's look at Matthew chapter 13, verse 54. Notice what the people said about Jesus at verse 55. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? They don't mention his father's name right here. Why? Because the father's no longer around. But look at John 19. The father wasn't around in the crucifixion. Someone who's close to you would be it when, when you're dying. But the father wasn't there. The mother was there. Look at John chapter 19 and verse 26. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, no father, and the disciple standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her unto his own home. Notice that John had to take care of Jesus' mother. Why? Joseph wasn't there 
around to take care of Mary. So there is no doubt that Joseph died during Jesus' childhood. So that much we do know. Another thing about Jesus we do know is Mark chapter 6. John 1, John 1, Mark 6, Mark 6. John 1, Mark 6, and then Mark 1, all right? Mark 1, Mark 6, and John 1. All right, I'm going to go ahead and launch it off because I don't have time, all right? So let me read it quickly. Now, another thing about Jesus' childhood that we do know is that he did live independently, all right? When he reached the age, just like everybody who's normal, he reached an age that was independent and he can live off by himself, because he didn't start his ministry until 30, okay? So he lived off by himself. He lived independently. And then he worked a normal job like many of you. And then what was his living? His living was carpenter. So he took over his father's business. So what happened? It's normal in the Old Testament. Father dies. Who inherits it? Who continues his possession, his work, and everything? The son, the firstborn. So Jesus Christ was doing that. That's what happened. All right, so let's look at Mark chapter 6. Notice right here at verse 3. Is not this the what? Carpenter, the son of Mary. So Jesus Christ did work as a carpenter. Uh, another thing right here is Mark chapter uh, John 1. Notice this is the first time you see the personal life of Jesus, a personal invitation. We're going to look at uh, John chapter 1 and then verse uh, 39, uh, 38, 38. Master, where dwellest thou? Right? That's the last part of verse 38. 39, he saith unto them, come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day. So notice that Jesus Christ, he did have his own studio. He did have his own apartment making means to pass through rent, like many other Bible believers who are going through the single life, struggling. And then Mark chapter 1, notice at verse 9, Mark chapter 1 and verse 9, where was all of this at? Notice he came from Nazareth, out of his own studio or apartment. Jesus Christ left there from Nazareth to see John the Baptist. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Persia. No, from Nazareth. So see, Jesus Christ was living, raised over there all of that time. All right? And then he had his own apartment, studio, or whatever you want to call it. He had his own place over there that time. Let's also look at uh, one more passage that we want to look at is Hebrews chapter 12 and chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and chapter 12. Now, here's the best thing, the best thing that I want to drop about Jesus' missing 18 years that you want to know about. Ooh, what is it? Is there another holy grail? Is there something fascinating deep? No, it's something so basic and simple, but you overlooked it, which could have been the biggest blessing to you. You might say, what is it? Notice this whole teaching, Jesus is just a normal life. A typical, normal life. Bible believer who has an uh, interest in the spiritual things of God. And he was criticized by people close to him for being weird and non-worldly. Yeah. And then he was like you studying in college and in school or whatever education, studying very hard. Why? Luke chapter 2, he increased in wisdom, stature. He worked at a job. He had social relationships with people where he had to maintain a good resume, a good testimony in the workplace among the, the, his landlords and the city and the inhabitants around him. Why? Luke chapter 2, well favor with God and man. But he wasn't like, you know, sociable and so uh, talkative. He was considered to be weird, just a normal person, spiritual about the things of God. Basically, he's like you. That's what you want to know. If there's something you want to get out of today's teaching is he's just like you. And those of you who are struggling and saying, man, I don't, uh, it's hard to ser serve God. And Jesus knows exactly what you're going through. It's hard to be single, you know, and then 
you know, try to live separately from the opposite sex and then not live together with the opposite sex before marriage. And Jesus knows that. John chapter 1. He lived by himself. And he had no relationships with the opposite sex over there. So, see, he made sure that he stayed as a clean testament. He didn't use any of the excuses like some of you Christians would. Jesus Christ, he knows every struggle you go through. Why? Because the Bible said so. You just didn't pay attention. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points, what? Tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He went through every struggle that you went through, right? Because he's a normal guy. Not a holy grail, druid revival guy. All right? He's normal, Amen. like you. Silent, oddball. I, maybe he's worse than some of you. You know that? He didn't have as much comforts like you guys did. He was isolated by a lot of people around him. Considered weird. He, he suffered the loss of a family member. All right, here's another one, Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12. That's why it makes sense God knows that, hey, because Jesus lived a normal life like a lot of you, I want you to follow his example. So in the missing 18 years of Jesus, you know what you need to do? You need to follow what he did during his missing 18 years when he was growing up. This is good teaching for teenagers and for youth, missing 18 years of Jesus. Recommend this video for them. It's a good video for them. Why? He was just like them, going through peer pressure, criticism, uh, no contact with the world, and success in job and everything like that. Yeah, I mean, uh, relationships, opposite sex and stuff like that. Jesus suffered everything that a young person went through, young adult and child and teenager went through. And he understands that. But what did God say? You have to look at him and lay aside every weight and sin from the world that puts you down. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse uh, 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. See, Jesus Christ knew what it was like to be patient. When you're young, you have the zeal. Jesus Christ, oh, when can I reveal the miracle, Lord? When can I preach? When can I teach? Not now. Wait till you're all, uh, wait for 18 years. Some people, when they get saved, they just want to do it immediately after a couple of months. No, 18 years. You know how long it took me? It took me about, uh, it took me almost 10 years. You might say, why, did, why are you early age still? Because I started early. That's the thing. That's why I keep urging you to start early. Why? Because you have to be patient until God calls you. To preach, to teach, to do public things where you get attention for yourself. Sometimes people want to do these things to get attention to these cells. The miracle, the preaching, the, to the show off, and the subscribers online, and then the church of a pastor and all that. See that? Jesus Christ went through all these struggles of a youth. Typical youth, what they went through and what they struggled with. But God says, run with patience and lay aside every weight. So what did Jesus Christ do? He laid aside his father's job. That's hard. Took over the family business, all their responsibility. Gave that up to serve the Lord. Didn't fall into peer pressure from the people. And then, what did he, he got baptized from John the Baptist. And then all of his, uh, he gave up everything, what? For just three and a half year ministry. That's it. That's it. Three and a half year ministry. Three and a half year ministry. All right, so I hope that this teaching was a blessing to you. That's bigger than Jesus getting a holy grail. You know what, you're, when you teach that kind of stuff, you know, what you're, uh, you know what you're getting rid of? That Jesus is a normal guy like me and went through the normal struggles like I did. What a blessing that I know what the Bible says about his missing 18 years. If anything, this video should be viral. Not the other videos about Jesus was with the Essenes or Notovish's exploration in India or Jesus Christ went to England with the Druids and all that. No, if anything more, it's the Bible. All right, Heavenly Father, I pray that today's teaching was a blessing to the hearers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.